Hi, this is Hilton Valentine of the Animals with John Broughton on Retrospectives, 3 SER Casey Radio. You have any uh, particular uh, childhood memories of music uh, becoming a, an area of interest for you? Um, well, I first got interested uh, in music and in particular uh, rock and roll um, when my elder brother um, bought a record player and started buying um, records, uh, and in particular uh, American um, releases. Um, things like uh, Bill Haley, Danny and the Juniors, Little Richard, Chuck Berry. Uh, and just then, um, there was a, a, a television program starting um, called The 6-5 Special. Uh, we were actually uh, able to see rock and roll being performed, not necessarily by American musicians, but by English musicians like uh, Cliff Richard and etc. etc. And the skiffle period was happening. Um, and Lonnie Donegan in particular, um, I don't know if you've heard of Lonnie Donegan over oh, there, yeah. but, yeah, good. <laughs> well, he was probably one of my major influences, and that was particularly because the songs, uh, and the music was, uh, very, very simple, and you could just sort of strum away on a guitar, uh, along to it, you know. So that's how I first started getting interested. You mentioned the, the American music that, that was uh, brought to your attention. How how accessible was this music to you over there growing up? Uh, well, things like um, well, people like uh, Chuck Berry, uh, Little Richard, Fats Domino, um, these were very accessible cause, because they were uh, records that were released in England. Um, it wasn't until um, I met up with uh, Eric, uh, Eric Burden and the rest of the lads that I was introduced to people like uh, Jimmy Reed and John Lee Hooker and uh, Moody Waters. They weren't so so easy to come by. Um, yeah, because you, you couldn't just sort of go into shops and, and purchase these kind of records. They, these these came in. I think it was um, a friend Derek had that um, was a merchant seaman, mm -hmm. and he was bringing stuff uh, back over from America. Right. Yeah. I'll put it that way. Was there any particular point in time where it started to become obvious to you that uh, you were headed down a, a road of, as a career of, as a musician? Um, well, I think it was like a gradual pr uh, process. Um, but, the, you know, once I started playing the guitar and, and you know, I had a, a little skiffle group uh, in the northeast of England here, um, the, it, it more and more became uh, my childhood dream, you know, to uh, actually uh, tour and uh, go on the road uh, b being a musician. Um, I remember standing outside the City Hall in Newcastle um, watching the, the, the coach come in with all, you know, all the various artists uh, getting off and going into the stage door. And, and I just remember this burning desire, you know, that this is what I want to do, you know. And I used to uh, sort of stand there and, and, and sort of dream that... Mm -hmm. uh, some guitarist in the band was sick and they needed somebody and I would leap forward and say well I can play a guitar <laughs> <laughs> but you know that was just like a little dream I had yeah. about the, the formation of the animals I think Alan Price was the first member that you came in touch with is that right? no he wasn't no? Uh, I, don't, I don't know where you got that information from um, it was Charles Chandler oh, right. um, I was playing in, in a band called the Wildcats uh, and the, the animals were then called the Alan Price Rhythm and Blues Combo. And Chas Chandler came down to a gig where the Wildcats were playing, because um, they were looking for a guitar player. Uh, and he asked me if I would be interested um, in, in joining the band and, and going to London, and because um, I'd never heard the band, so he invited me to a gig, and I went along, and uh, I was just knocked out, you know, especially with uh, Eric's. Eric's vocals, um, and then I had a sort of an audition um, a few days later, and uh, and that's when it started. You were in. Do you remember your first gig? Um, not not particularly, no. But it must have been uh, the Club of Gogo in Newcastle because the uh, the band had a residency there twice a week. Ah, oh, yeah, yeah. Looking back on it now. I mean, you're all obviously very young at the time. How do you think you coped with the, the mass adulation and, and stardom that, that you received at that at that time? <laughs> um, I think me personally, I just became intoxicated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
you know, all of a sudden it was the uh, the childhood childhood dream becoming a reality. Yeah. And I was the youngest in the band. Um, I think it was 19 or 20 when when the uh, the break happened. Um, and I don't think I coped with it too well. <laughs> <laughs> Went over the top, so to speak. It's a lot to take in at such a young age, isn't it? It is, yeah. yeah. You know, you're going from uh, scrimping and scraving to buy uh, an amplifier or a guitar and you get it on the, the monthly payments to all of a sudden, you know, you're being offered all of this equipment and, and it's just totally the other way around. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Of all, you had a, a great string of successes there in, in the 60s. Um, do you remember any one session in particular where once you had, had the song finished, you just knew that you had something particularly special there? What was even released? Yeah, yes, it, uh, in particular, um, House of the Rising Sun. Yeah. Uh, you know, when, when we first, uh, when we recorded that, and we heard the playback, because uh, it, was, it was done very quickly, it was done in just in the, the, the amount of time that it took to record it, you know, just to, to play it. We we went in the studio, uh, we ran through it, and then Mickey Moore said, okay, we'll go for a take. Um, then we we did it again, and that was it. And on hearing that playback, um, I, I just said immediately, that's, that's going to be a number one. How was the relationship between the band and Mickey Moe's? Um... I suppose in the beginning it, it was it was all right, you know. Um, I think Mickey's uh, great contribution to uh, the early animals was um, he had an ear um, to pick uh, hit singles. Uh, unfortunately, he he didn't uh, pick House of Rising Sun, but he he did pick the first single, Baby Let Me Take You Home, and and he brought in uh, Don't Let Me Be Misunderstood. Uh, and stuff like that. And he brought records over from America um, that were released in America that weren't released in England and uh, presented them to us. And, um, you know, it, I mean, he he was pretty pretty good at that kind of thing. How about record companies? How did you get along with record company during that time? Because the, they would have put a fair bit of pressure on you, I would imagine, to, to keep the hits coming. Oh yes, um, that was always there. I mean, fr from the day we had the first hit record, um, it was pressure all down the line uh, from record companies, from publicists, from promotion people, from agents to to work. We were we were just worked like <laughs> like a dog. <laughs> um, and yes, I re a matter of fact, that after the first single, um, they were cl uh, clamoring for an album, and we recorded an album. Uh, plus House of the Rising Sun um, on a, a, like a, an all night session I think we were travelling from Liverpool uh, down to the south coast of England and we went into the studio like I think about midnight or one o'clock in the morning finished the recording uh, probably about I don't know four or five and then travelled on um, to the south coast to do the gig that night it was pretty hectic. That, that's hard work, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, I, you know, I suppose when you're young and all that and it's what you want to do, it's, it's not so bad. Yeah. <laughs> but it was tiring. There's a lot of ma mass hysteria surrounding bands such as yours at the, at the time. How difficult was it to, to maintain you know, a good quality of live performance with, with, with crowds just screaming back at you like that? Um, I think it was quite difficult, uh, bec mainly because the gigs uh, uh, got bigger. Um, and I think the, the the bigger the gig, and remember, we, we didn't really have the PA systems in them days that, w that you have nowadays where you've got maybe t uh, 10,000 watts of uh, uh, monitor systems and stuff like that. Um, so the music was lost, I think, and, and in particularly in America, mm -hmm. um, because that was... W uh, where the, most of the mass hysteria was happening, you know, we'd walk on stage and it was it was like what you see these films of the Beatles and stuff, and it's just screaming and screaming from beginning to end. I think it was a little different in Europe and um, the UK where people uh, were coming along to to hear the music uh, a bit more than what they were in America. Yeah, but yeah, it did seem to get lost a bit, and it was just became a. 
well, let's go on stage, do do a bit, and get off. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, most, and then and then there's as well. We only did like say a thirty minute spot or a forty five minute spot at the most. And oh, it, was usually on, it was usually on a show with other uh, artists, you know. Right, it was a large bill, yeah. Yeah. Point in time when when you felt the the relationship between Eric and the rest of the band started to to waver a bit. Um. Yeah, I think it wasn't so much uh, Eric and the rest of the band. I think it was just uh, uh, all of us, and, and including Eric, uh, were just getting really, really sick of um, the amount of touring we're doing and the demands that were being put on us. Um, and just the workload was just uh, too much, you know. And I think Eric was sort of taken to one side by the then manager, Mike Jeffrey, and said, well, you know, Eric, it's, this isn't quite right, and uh, blah, blah, blah. And if we disband the animals and form, you know, new animals or something, you will be in control, you'll be able to have everything the way you want it. I think that's the way it sort of happened. Right. Yeah. What What did you think of that new version of the animals that, that he put together? Um, well, I think um, it was good. It, it just sort of got away from the, the blues uh end of it but you know eric is a very creative talent um and he's o- was always looking for ways of expressing himself and and i think his songwriting became very um you know came in, into play mm-hmm. um, much more than what it was with the uh, the original animals and he really wrote some great songs in, in that period you ever stop and ponder what direction you guys would have taken had you stayed with eric i think you would have gone that um, way as well I think we we probably would have would have went in that that similar kind of direction, the psychedelia sort mm-hmm. of. Um, and I was uh, experimenting with uh, different sounds, uh, in particular like uh, fuzz tones and stuff like that. And we probably would have went the same route as maybe the odd birds. Um, yeah, music in that kind of direction. Now, there were a couple of reunions of the original lineup in the 70s and again in the early 80s. How do you look back on those now? Um, well, I thought they were good, you know. It's like the, the one thing that I felt with the animals was when we actually were playing, when we were on stage performing and uh, uh, playing with music, you know, every, uh, everything was fine. <laughs> it was uh, off stage <laughs> when um, the problems started, and yeah. the bickering and, and all that. But that the '83 tour, I thought uh, that was very good. It was all augmented. We had um, another guitar player with us, another keyboard player, or a percussionist, uh, and a, a sax player. And I, I thought that the stuff we were doing at that time was 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 very good. Certainly, no regrets about doing that. Oh no, no, not at all. No, it also helped me want to to play again, you know, because I had stopped playing for quite a few years. Did you? Oh yeah, yeah. Just just the bad taste in my mouth, you know, with the, everything that went down and uh, getting ripped off <laughs> <laughs> and all that kind of stuff. So what did you do with yourself during that time? Oh God, um, I just I hung around London uh, for a couple of years. And then I went over to uh, the west coast of America, uh, Los Angeles, and I lived there for about seven years, um, just writing some songs and stuff, but nothing that was of, of any oh. worth, you know. You didn't, you didn't put the guitar away totally then. Um, well, yeah, I did. After 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 I was in LA for about uh, two or three years, um, I sort of uh, every time I got my guitar out and played it, it just felt like like a big tree trunk in my arms, you know, and it just felt awful. And it wasn't actually until I, I came back to England, and that would have been 77 or 78, and um, I just I just started playing in a, a small rock and roll band, and I found myself uh, actually being able to enjoy playing again. Yeah, that was probably a break you needed to have. Yes, yes, that's right. Present day, and talk about the, this new version of the animals you've got going. Was there any any worry, any tenderness, tenderness about getting uh, a new version of the animals together? Any worry that you, you may not be able to rekindle the old spark there? Um, no, but the, the the only thing that you know that ever I mean, many people have suggested to me, you know, why don't um, uh, 
do an animal thing uh, again. And the only thing that really stopped me from even contemplating it was, you know, who who would be able to do the vocals? Because, you, you, you know, you could, not everybody can sort of uh, sing in the same style as uh, Eric Burden. Yeah. Uh, and th- this this lineup actually it sort of um, it came about in a very natural way. Um, I was playing in a band, a uh, local band in the northeast of England called the Alligators, um, and this singer uh, Robert Kane, um, uh, who was there fronting the band, um, it sort of we, we did some some recordings, just uh, like, uh, demo recordings. And it just, I, know, I just couldn't believe how much um, he sounded like Eric. Um, possibly because of the numbers that we're doing, it was all all blues, rhythm and blues mm. stuff. Yeah. Um, and I hadn't noticed it when I was actually playing, you know, in, in the band with him. But I'm, I'm just listening back to the recordings. So then we started um, putting in a few of the old animal hits into the set. Like, we've got to get out this place and uh, don't let me be misunderstood. And they went down a treat, you know, they were really, went down well, well received. And it sort of, it, it came from there, um, uh, putting a, a, a set together as a tribute to the animals. Right. Um, and then we, we we decided, well, we'll call ourselves, when we got John in the band, uh, John Steele, the drummer, we said, well, well, we'll go out as animals too. And that's what we that's what we did, and we've been doing it for about four and a half years now. Oh, so... It wasn't the initial intention then to, to get a version of the animals together. It just sort of fell together that way in, in time, didn't it? No, it just, it just sort of uh, happened. It was a, yeah. a natural process. Mm-hmm. A complete rundown of, of the guys in the band now. Okay. Uh, on lead vocals is uh, Robert Kane. On bass guitar is Martin Bland. Uh, lead guitar, Steve Dawson. And on keyboards, Steve Hutchinson and John Steele on drums and myself on guitar. And, and what's the extent of your live work these days? Uh, it's quite extensive. Um, we travel all over the world. Um, last year we were in Poland, uh, Australia. We did uh, about 10 days in Australia. New Zealand, Southeast Asia. We did six weeks in America. And we're going back and forward over to Europe and um, Scandinavia uh, quite quite regularly. I don't think you made it down to Melbourne last time you were here, though, did you? I think you just did uh, the northern states. Is that right? No, we, no it was... Um, well, where were we? On the east coast. Yeah. Around about the, the Gold Coast area. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Any, any um, talks about uh, following up another visit down here in the, in the near future? There is, yeah. There's uh, talk about getting over this year. Um, but I haven't got any dates. But, you know, if if something does get um, finalised, I'll certainly uh, let you know through the email. Terrific. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. Uh, what kind of venues are you, are you playing? Is it mainly clubs or, or small well, theatre it's, it's all kinds. Um, we'll, we'll play uh, blues clubs. Uh, we'll play pubs. We'll play marquees. We'll play festivals. Uh, when we do Scandinavia, we might find ourselves one night uh, playing in front of fifteen, twenty thousand people at a festival, and the next night playing in a little blues club that holds maybe a hundred people. Right, so a good and mix there. it just varies. Yeah. And you're finding it's a good mix of of old animals fans and new fans coming to see you as well. It is, yeah, yeah. Uh, we were really um, amazed in Poland. Um, we we played there last year, as I said, and, uh, on a bill with some uh, Polish artists, uh, three or four like uh, uh, named artists in Poland, and uh, we were playing, well, I don't know, maybe between 5,000 and 10,000 uh, auditoriums, and the places were packed, and we just couldn't believe the amount of young people um, that were coming to these gigs. Oh, that's great. So it's yeah. not, not just people on a nostalgia trip, it's no, new fans no. as well. Yeah, I think you know uh, kids that have um, the, the parents may have the records, you know, and, and they've, they've liked the records, and they thought, well, let's go and see what what, what it's like life. Yeah, yeah, and really enjoying it. Would you pin down any any qualities that this version of the of the animals has that the original perhaps didn't have? Hmm, that's, that's a hard one. 
Um, Maybe getting along better off stage. Voices, yeah, that was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was. Yeah, we get on very well, <laughs> um, which which is which really helps. You know, yeah. uh, life is a lot simpler and a lot uh, uh, more pleasant on the road when everybody gets on with everybody. Um, and we, you know, we're quite honest about what we're doing, and uh, or at least we try to be. Um, there's a lot of promoters still put us out, as, you know, under the name of the animals instead of animals too, mm-hmm. you know, because um, we don't want to con anybody. We don't want anybody to to think that this is the original lineup. Yeah. Um, and I think uh, musically and sound wise. Uh, things are a lot better, uh, mainly because of uh, technical equipment. That it's not that we use any any gadgets or anything, but just the quality of sound from amplifiers and PA systems is a lot better than what it was in the 60s. I've got one final portion of our chat with Hilton Valentine to go. Let's have it. Any plans for any new studio recordings from Animals Two? Uh, well, yes, we are talking about it. We've already done one CD. I think uh, you've probably heard um, a few samples of that on the, yes. on the yep. web page uh, with that new version of House Horizon Sun on it. And we are talking about uh, going back in the studio this year, but we haven't actually tied anything down yet. So on stage, what, what would make up your set list? Is it uh, a good mix of old animals hits and... I assume yeah, a few would, blues covers there as well. Yeah, I would say it's probably about 75% uh, or 80% of the, uh, all, most of the early hits that the animals had, the stuff that John and I were actually played on. Yeah. And that's maybe 20% of uh, stuff that the animals might have done, um, you know, all the blues standards that the animals might have done but never got round to it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and a couple of original things. How do uh, 1990s audiences compare to 1960s audiences for you? Uh, that's a hard one as well because I think, you know, when the animals first came around, we were young and the audience was young and there's probably a lot more uh, sort of energy and uh, excitement went on in the 60s. Uh, you know, part of this mass hysteria stuff and all that, but we don't get that now. It's you know, it's a like most of the audience that come, uh, they, they are excited and they're very appreciative, but they are coming to listen. Yeah, yeah, be more yeah. more appreciative of the music rather than being part of an, an event or something. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, If you had to pin it down to one thing, how would you sum up the, the animal's main contribution to music? Uh, I would say. Mainly the fact that we were, we were playing um, American, uh, black American rhythm and blues, uh, which eventually went back to America. <laughs> um, and, and the kids being able to accept the, this kind of material um, because we were English and because we were white. Um, and opened up the door for them to actually listen to the stuff that was on their own doorstep. And what sort of music you listen to yourself these days? Um, I listen to a variety of stuff. Um, my me, me wife is into music, and she's got a, quite a few uh, CDs of uh, bands that are coming out of America. I uh, there's a band called the Lilies. I don't know if you've heard of them. Uh, I've heard the name. But, yeah. Yeah, um, and they're they're sort of doing kind of uh, English, you know, '60s kind of material of. Uh, a feeling of that stuff, but with the added impetus of being young and having an American uh, uh, sort of uh, ad- addition to it. Uh, it's like a mixture of Kinks, Stones, and Beatles, The Who, all sort of rolled up into one with an American the cherry on the top <laughs> and it's it's you know it's sounding good you know it's sounding very good okay. i also listen to you know still stuff from the 60s and uh she's opened my eyes to a lot of stuff that the pretty things did which i never even heard and stuff like that and you mentioned course, still, yeah sorry that's fine you mentioned the uh, the website before and i've got the address in front of me here it's uh dot com. And uh, lots of great stuff in there, audio samples of the CD. And you can purchase the CD online, is that right? Yes, you can, yep. Yep, heaps of other merchandise, T-shirts. 
Yep. Photos and uh, tour dates. So if anyone wants yep. to uh, find out what animals tour are up to, that's the address to go to. Mm-hmm. And what else is on your books for the rest of 98? Um, yeah, we're doing some Vegas festivals, <laughs> which are always good fun to do. They're great. Um, we're going back over to Scandinavia, possibly Australia. Uh, we're going over to America again. And also we'll have to find some time to get into the studio and do a bit more recording. Terrific. Well, busy time ahead. Great. Well, Hilton, it's uh, great to speak to you. I want to uh, thank you for your time uh, this afternoon. No uh, worries, mate. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a pleasure talking to you, and thanks for many years of uh, wonderful music, and it's great to hear the spirit of the animals are still alive and well there with animals too. Okay, thank you, John. And I uh, hope we catch up with you when you're uh, down here next. Yeah, for sure. All the best. Okay, mate. Thanks, cheers. Bye.